All right, talking about foundations in front of the Apache Software Foundation crowd is intimidating. So uh, I just want to start by saying I don't purport to know everything about uh, foundations or open source. I, uh, I used to uh, subscribe to mailing lists that uh, discuss these matters, license discuss, if some of you are on these mailing lists, there's a few others. And I finally just had to unsubscribe because uh, it's just a huge volume in terms of, you know, talking about the differences between foundations and open source licenses and things like that. So today I thought I would just give you my perspective, the perspective that we're seeing from the Linux Foundation on the role of foundations in software and the IT industry. But uh, I, again, I don't purport to know everything. So take everything I say with a small grain of salt. I also want to say this is not my first Apache Con. This, has anybody, I think there are a few people in the audience here who know that I've had some experience with the Apache Software Foundation in the past. Uh, in fact, I attended my first Apache Con in the UK uh, quite a long time ago. I think this must have been 2002, 2003. I can't remember the exact date. 2000? Come on, guys, you're, giving, you're dating me. You know, you, See, you're already calling me out. Uh, but there I am in the, uh, on the very far right-hand side of my right over there, and uh, you can see a bunch of folks there. Uh, but the most notable guy is in the center there. That's Douglas Adams, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, who was the far better keynote than I uh, could ever be at the, that Apache Con. But, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I think qualifies me for, uh, for speaking today, and you know, kind of what we do and what I do at the Linux Foundation uh, centers around this guy. How many people here know who that is? Pretty much everyone. So that's Linus Torvalds, the creator of Linux. Uh, and uh, I am actually Linus Torvalds' boss. That's right. <laughs> I'm also the boss of this girl. That's my five-year-old daughter, Nisha. Uh, and, and, and what's interesting is Lena Swervalds and my daughter Nisha are actually very similar. <laughs> no, it's, it, it, it's true. First, they're both adorable. <laughs> Don't you think? Second, they're clearly both geniuses, in particular my daughter. But most importantly, neither of them listen to anything that I say, right? And so essentially that's what I do at the Linux Foundation. That's what the Linux Foundation does. I pay Linus Torvalds paycheck, uh, and we have a bunch of stuff uh, around Linus to help the kernel community do the great work they do. But really, the great work that goes on at the Linux Foundation in Linux really is testimony to the power of the individual developer. The power of the kind of work that each of you do every day. It's amazing that, you know, a developer like this, like Linus Torvalds over 20 years ago, can start a project uh, that changes development itself that really spawns companies worth billions of dollars and really changes the world. And if you think about it, what was that software that Linus Torvalds created that changed development? Does anybody know? You're thinking Linux, but it was actually Git. The guy, you know, it's like two holes in one, this guy, right? You know, he had to write, you know, not only Linux, but he had to write Git. And then this is not a promo for Git, and I realize that there are other things out there that are equally good. All right, I, I have to kind of defend Linus. I, we're partial to Git over at the Linux Foundation. But the reason I'm bringing up Git is because Git did change the way software is developed in a way that uh, pro I'm sure that Linus did, did not expect. But what it did do is, in particular, in conjunction with GitHub, and there are other forges that are similar, it, it sort of brought in the era of social coding, right? Which I think is really important. And I, I kind of took a look at this by looking at GitHub, 
and looking at the impact that GitHub has had on big open source projects as of late. And what you can see here is, is on the vertical, you've got uh, GitHub stars, sort of indication of popularity. The size of the circle is the size of the uh, development community, and then you've got time. And what you're seeing here are projects like Bootstrap, Node.js, AngularJS, that have leveraged the social coding and the infrastructure around GitHub and Git to grow insanely fast. The, these projects really exploded. I mean, it, it is just amazing to see how they're leveraging it. And I bring this up because I get asked a question a lot about GitHub relative to foundations. And I think yesterday in one of the keynotes, I actually heard someone mention this as well relative to the Apache Software Foundation. You probably get asked the same question, which is, if you've got GitHub, what do you need with a foundation, right? Can't you just, why don't you just, I mean, it seems to be working, right? Why don't you just throw your code up on GitHub and things are going to explode? And so that's the question I want to explore with all of you guys today is what is the role of foundations in this sort of post GitHub era where you can throw code up on a forge and these projects seem to explode? And what I would say to that, and my answer to that is sort of multifold, but the first thing I would say to that is foundations enable social coding. Let me ask yourself, I just said GitHub really was a breakthrough in terms of large-scale social coding, right? So which is it? Do you, is it? Is it things like GitHub and Forges, or is it foundations that enable social coding? Well, when I think of social coding, I think of more than just coding via GitHub. See, for me, this is non-social coding, right? And this is kind of a funny picture, very popular on the internet, but it's the idea that sort of people are isolated in their own environment, in their own rooms, and they're doing this coding, and it's social over the internet, but it's not social in the way that I think is important and that really is the reason we're all here. This is social coding. All of you being here is social coding. One of the things that we really want to do at the Linux Foundation is provide events like this. The reason is social coding isn't just about IRC and GitHub and email lists and so forth. Coding is really not only about the code itself, but it's about the trust relationships that are developed over long period of time amongst developers that are creating software that's literally changing the world. And so events like this are extremely important to the Linux Foundation. I think that they're extremely important to the ASF. When I first started working on events at the Linux Foundation over almost 10 years ago, the only reason we were doing it was to enable faster collaboration, technical collaboration. We didn't, create a, we didn't want to create a trade show. There were tons of Linux trade shows at the time. What we really wanted to do was create a place where technical developers can get together and hash out the things that just aren't getting hashed out over a mailing list or by other means. And it really worked. If you go to a Linux event they're very that, we, that we're producing, they're very technical, and it's really a way for developers to get together and hash this stuff out and move forward. And we've been doing that successfully for 10 years. And clearly you need a foundation to do that. You can't have an Apache Con without the Apache Software Foundation. But there's more things that foundations do that I think are important and they're important in the context of sort of the future of large-scale software development. And Mark sort of alluded to this in his talk, but at the Linux Foundation, we think that foundations enable large-scale and structured investment in open source projects and in technology writ large. And this is really important. You don't get this just throwing code up on a forge. You have to have infrastructure around a project to do this, and I'll explain what that looks like. 
But what I first want to look at is the nature of investment in tech at large. The top 10 tech companies in the, in the, in the world, in the IT industry, spend about $63 billion on research and development. It is a big number. Here's what the numbers look like. You know, Microsoft, 9 billion, Cisco, 5.8 billion, Google, 5 billion. These are huge numbers. These are the numbers that they're spending on R&D inside of their companies, working on a wide variety of newfangled stuff that they hope to bring to market and sell to all of us, and we're all gonna love it. And when I talk to organizations like this, I always ask them one question. How do you manage your external research and development? This is the big change that's going on in the IT industry that really the open source movement was the vanguard of, but is now becoming institutionalized. It's the idea that all of us are smarter than any one of us. It's the idea that research and development no longer is about hiring a bunch of super smart folks, locking them in a room, hoping they'll come up with some brilliant idea in isolation, and then going and selling that to the world. Research development is about development that happens inside your company, but increasingly outside of your organizations through open source. The Linux kernel alone is a multi-billion dollar R&D investment that you know, thousands and thousands of companies uh, leverage to you know, produce uh, you know, products and services that run most of modern society. You know, the ASF is hosting similar large-scale projects that really have an import on society. So how is in industry doing this? How are people managing their external research and development? Well, it's interesting. They've got pros. There are professionals within the better tech companies who recognized some time ago that managing external R&D, that participating in the open source community, isn't just something you do ad hoc or haphazardly. It's something that you have professional people manage. The folks you're looking at here, Chris DeBona, you know, Alan Clark, Ibrahim Haddad, Mar Mark Hinkle up there. Mark, you gotta change your LinkedIn profile pic, by the way. Dan Fry at IBM. These folks, full-time job is managing external R&D for their companies. And they're the largest technology companies in the world, in many cases. They're, they're not only full-time job is to do that, they actually have very large organizations. In some cases, with hundreds of people who decide what code leaves an organization, what code comes into the organization, how to share what they want to share, how to keep what they want to keep, that study the IP regimes for, of all of this open source code that they're consuming, that make sure that license compliance happens when code is shipped in a product, who really have systematized where their engineers should spend their time, which up and coming open source projects should they assign engineers to, because in the future they might leverage that external research and development in the products and, and services that they're going to have. This is a huge professional endeavor that some of the best companies in tech have been doing for quite some time, but are, are really doing more and more systematically as of late. And the result is impressive. These companies are leveraging billions of dollars of free software. You know, I mean, in, just in the consumer electronic industry alone, nobody really makes anything these days without open source in it. E even if you have an iPhone, you know, people think of Apple as this incredibly closed proprietary software company. But if you go into your iPhone or your iPad into the general about and legal notices section, You'll find code in there from the ASF. You'll find the GPL license in there. You will find lots and lots of open source code. Nobody builds anything these days without open source because you just aren't gonna get to market fast enough. You're, you're not gonna be able to do it on your own. The folks who manage this external R&D are in charge of leveraging billions of dollars. I would say equal in value to the billions of dollars of internal R&D that goes on in these companies as well. These folks align their business with upstream projects. We see in the kernel community, for example, that companies are 
actually building device support for their products with the intention of getting that patch upstream the day that the product, product goes to market. They literally have this lockstep development approach as they're building a product, making sure that the code that they're going to need long term is up to snuff to get into the mainline kernel, right? Because they don't want to have to constantly be forking open source projects and then maintaining these forks for a long period of time. That would defeat the whole purpose of why they got into using this great shared external research and development. Most importantly, I think these folks sh are, are in charge of sharing what they want to share and keeping what they want to keep. I still get questions today from different sectors of the tech industry or even folks that are not in tech, it, you know, maybe the automotive industry is a decent example, saying, you know, well, if I use open source in a car, does that mean I have to give away all my intellectual property? which of course folks here at the ASF know is not the case. If you understand open source licenses and how they work, it's very easy to share what you want to share and keep what you want to keep from an IP perspective. And then I think one of the most important things that we're seeing at the Linux Foundation today is that companies who have open source friendly policies are actually using that to hire the best developers in the world. I mean, there's really a huge war going, a talent war going on in the tech industry uh, that's best exemplified by the uh, antitrust suits that were recently bought where, you know, large companies were basically colluding to not poach each other's engineers, right? They, talent is so important, software talent in particular is so important, these companies were willing to break the law in order to get that talent. And uh, what we're seeing is that open source friendly companies really do attract the best talent. And the best talent also comes from open source. If you get a patch into a, a major open source project, in many cases it, it's a guarantee for a job. Particularly in the Linux kernel, we're seeing, you know, if you get a patch in there, employers are calling you instantly. And so as this professionalization happens in terms of managing external research and development, leveraging all of this open source, foundations are also starting to play a critical role. And that role is really the role that the ASF or the Linux Foundation or a variety of other foundations play. And you know, I think at the ASF you stated very well, I've kind of simplified it here. It's a neutral place where resources can be collected and shared. I mean, that's kind of the root of what you're doing, right? And these are not small resources. These are huge, multi-million dollar investments that people want to make, the, whether it's through developers in terms of their time amounting to millions and millions of dollars in value, or actual money, or intellectual property that's being donated from within a company into an open source project, what the industry is really saying is we need a neutral place to know that we're sharing this stuff collectively and that no single actor can kind of game the system to their advantage, right? And what's interesting is there's a historical precedent for that. And the historical precedent is really standards development organizations, SDOs. And what we're really seeing here is open source now filling the role in an organized way through foundations that standards developing organizations have played in the industry for many, many years. It used to be when industry, the tech sector in particular, wanted to collaborate, they would go to uh, ISO or IEEE or some standards organization. These are professional, you know, I'll call them foundations, SDOs, that have very large staff that manage intellectual property, albeit in a very different way as an open source foundation, but are in the intellectual property management business themselves. It's where people can get together in a way that's antitrust free to go and do this form of collaboration. And they would produce these, you know, thousand page specs and they would hand them to people and then folks would go out and implement them. 
or in some cases they would ignore the specs entirely and then they would create this network effect and they would become this sort of de facto standard and then they would create this monopoly that would dominate the industry forever. Uh, but those days are over. <laughs> not, not that I take it personally. Uh, but those days are over. And I want to give you a recent example of it that I think uh, epitomizes this best. So we're, we host, uh, the, the Linux Foundation's kind of becoming a foundation of foundations, for lack of a better term. So we host a foundation that was recently launched last year, late in the year in December, called the All Seen Alliance. And this is a, a, a project uh, for the Internet of Things. It's a code base that basically allows, a, it's a framework essentially for uh, proximity networks on, you know, tiny little things in the home, uh, smartphones, automobiles, connected light bulbs and so forth. That allows, you know, a light bulb to be discovered on a network, to be able to sort of publish its capabilities and then to be able to interact with other things in the house, a television set, a stereo, a speaker, whatever it might be. But what's interesting is there have been a lot of standard setting efforts in the Internet of Things to go out and define interoperability at that sort of proximity, uh, sort of edge of the, the, the network of IoT, you know, to enable devices to, DLNA I think is probably one of the better examples. This is a standard that, a specification that allows uh, audio streaming to sort of happen. And when the folks in this foundation, companies like Qualcomm, Companies uh, like LG, Panasonic, Cisco all got together. What they said was, I cannot hand a 600 page specification to a light bulb manufacturer and hope that this is actually going to work. It's just not going to happen, right? And so they said, listen, what we want to do is create interoperability, but we're going to do that by all working off a common code base, and that will create the standard, and that will create not only the better interoperability that we're looking for, but the actual code that folks can go take and use to create these incredible experiences that you're going to see, you know, maybe a year from now. There are actual products that are coming out in the market this year based on that code base. Probably would have taken several years to even get a specification developed, right? But these things are actually going to be in the market this year. And so I think it's important that the world is moving in this direction from SDOs to really organized foundations that are enabling this kind of large-scale open source development. Another interesting thing that I thought about when thinking about foundations was sort of why do you need a neutral place, right? Because there are, you know, I looked at like Node.js and these things and, you know, these are, uh, Code bases, uh, in, in many cases, trademarks that are owned by one company. You know, MySQL might have been a good example of where you can go kind of have a corporate open source project and that worked. And I looked at a study from a few years ago that stated that there appears to be a glass ceiling on the growth of large single vendor open source projects. That at a certain point, if a project gets important enough, if the industry decides they want to use it at really large scale, if it's controlled by a single vendor, even if it's open source, it just doesn't make it. It just doesn't get as big as the ones that have a neutral home. And I think that it'll be interesting to see in the post GitHub era, where you can kind of get this explosive growth even if it's sort of a single vendor product project, uh, if that will be sustainable over long periods of time or if those projects as well will hit a glass ceiling and will eventually need to make their way into a neutral home so that people can do the kind of large scale systematic investment that I'm characterizing it. And I don't know if that will happen, but I think it is likely to happen. I think that this glass ceiling will likely remain. And I think that you will see more foundations come into being. I think you will see more projects come to the ASF. I think you will see other foundations emerge where they want to set up a, their own unique structure of governance. You see the OpenStack Foundation launched uh, you know, a few years ago and has had pretty decent success so far. 
The Open Daylight Project is, uh, it's it had its first birthday yesterday. How many people here know of the Open Daylight Project? So the Open Daylight Project has its own foundation. Uh, they just won uh, the Interop uh, Grand Prize, the first open source project that ever won the best in show at Interop, which is sort of the Oscars of the networking industry, after just one year. This shows just how important these large scale projects really are. And so I think I've established that foundations like the ASF, like the Linux Foundation, like these others are important and that they're sort of taking the role of what SDOs used to do in the past. But the, the next question is, what is the real work of an open source foundation? Now this is where we sort of get into the details, right? And I thought I would talk about the work that I do at the Linux Foundation as an example of sort of what the work, the actual work that is done at a foundation looks like. And I thought I'd borrow an internet meme to, to make that point. So I think you probably all are aware of this internet meme, but uh, this is really what my friends think I do at the Linux Foundation, what I'm, actually, what I'm doing right now. I travel around the world, I give speeches, I pontificate about these broad IT trends and how they intersect with open source. That's the cool job that I have at the Linux Foundation. Now what my mom thinks I do is more like this. You know, and this has really nothing to do with the Linux Foundation. My mom, I just, I love her so much, she just thinks I'm a Boy Scout. It's because she has no idea what I do actually, but she just happens to think I'm more like a Boy Scout. Society, of course, thinks this is what the Linux Foundation does. You guys have gotten this too. I knew it. I knew it. You're all, what are you, sharing everything? You, sh you should have seen the crestfallen look on my wife's face on our first date when I told her I worked at a nonprofit. It was just, it was this palpable look of disappointment. She still married me though. This is what developers think I do. This is, I, I kind of, you know, they I basically think I, I don't really do anything and I give these speeches, but they, I, you know, I talk a lot, but obviously in this sort of not so nice way and make really no sense and totally incoherent. I, I hope that's not what people think, but I'm very suspicious that's what many developers think of me. Now, of course, here's what I think of myself, right? I'm the boss of Linus Torvalds, right? It's the greatest job in the world. It's one of the biggest, most successful open source projects in history that he created. But this is what I actually do. And, and, and this is the point of foundations from the Linux Foundation's perspective, which is, you know, I, I, both me and a lot of the folks who work at the, the foundation, we're kind of the janitor. The, you know, the Wi-Fi at the conference is just never good enough, <laughs> right? We, we want to keep the servers that enable this large scale collaboration up and running and secure and it could never be good enough. We want to provide a legal framework around this that allows for the collaboration process to be defended. You know, there are legal issues with open source that need to be defended. And we have created many structures around open source license compliance, patent defense, in order to protect. And it can never be good enough. You know, in, in the world of intellectual property, I asked a professor at Stanford Law School once, you know, what's the one thing we could do to really make and protect open source, uh, you know, whether it's related to licensing or patents? And his response was, it's not one thing, it's everything. And that's part of being the janitor, is just keeping it clean. Because if you ask me, what we do at the Linux Foundation, or anyone who works at the Linux Foundation, sort of who we work for, uh, no one would say they work for me. What they would all say is that we work for the developers. And even though we have members from huge, large organizations uh, who you know, join and give us money to support all of this work, what we tell them is, you know, we will help fit your business to the development model that's going on over here, not vice versa. We're not gonna force the community to conform to your business norms. What you're gonna do is conform to the community norms in order to leverage the billions of dollars in shared R&D that is represented in open source. And guess what? That's what victory looks like. 
for open source and for foundations like this. The business community has now realized that what you guys started a long time ago is truly a better way to add value to their companies within the structure that wasn't established by a company but was really established by a community. And at the Linux Foundation, we just sort of think of ourselves as the janitor for that community to kind of work behind the scenes to make it work well. Working with you guys on this event is exactly in line with that goal, right? We want to be behind the scenes enabling the great work that goes on at the ASF. Nothing more, nothing less. And so I want to leave with one interesting question about foundations and open source projects that I've been thinking a lot about lately as we get into sort of very large scale collaborative development. Think, you know, big market shaping, market moving open source efforts, right, that are sort of created spontaneously. And the question comes from the, the executive director of one of the foundations that the Linux Foundation hosts, the Open Daylight Project, Neela Jacques, uh, the executive director there, asked this question, which is, can you boy band an open source project, right? Can companies get together, right, and sort of, you know, in a structured fashion, create an open source project, right? That's going to be successful. You know, kind of like new kids on the block were successful, right? I'm really dating myself now. But the question is really, do the best open source projects have to start this way, right? Do they have to start in a dorm room or, you know, with a bunch of folks who are trading patches over the internet, sort of acting spontaneously and kind of, does the bottoms up approach work? Or can in this new era where business kind of gets open source, now sees the value, can you use a tops down approach to create a, a project, right? Does it really have to, to, to happen all in, you know, a dorm room at, at, at dawn? By the way, I told uh, Linus that if I ever show a picture of him shirtless, that I would also show a picture of myself shirtless. So you'll have to forgive me all, but there's, <laughs> there I am. But will we see more foundations that will enable large-scale collaboration from day one? You know, I, I would kind of... Uh, I don't think many of these projects would like me to characterize them as boy bands of open source, but these are you know, structured projects that got together and day one wanted to have, you know, Open Daylight is a year old. They have 150 developers working on the project in a million lines of code. It took a long time for a lot of projects to get to that point. And this is me, you know, the, this will be in a half a dozen products this year from very large technology vendors. This was a systematic approach to open source. It seems like it is working to me. I think time will tell, but it looks like it's working. Because open source foundations, I think, are really becoming a norm for large scale R&D. And if you're over 40 like me, you'll get the reference here, but the new kids in the block, actually Marky Mark, became a very talented and well-esteemed actor over time. And I think that's what's gonna happen with foundations. I think organizations like the ASF, organizations like the Linux Foundation are going to be these critical organizations that will enable very large scale research and development that will be completely in line with business and may expand beyond the software industry itself. We host a project in the life sciences industry at the Linux Foundation these days because everybody gets it. This is what victory looks like, this kind of large-scale collaborative development. That's what foundations do. But of course, all of you already knew that. Thank you very much. <laughs>